Did ancient civilizations use sound technology? There has been much speculation about whether ancient civilizations used sound technology to accomplish various tasks. While there is no definitive evidence to suggest that this was the case, there are some intriguing clues that suggest that ancient people may have had a much greater understanding of sound and vibration than we previously thought. One of the most intriguing pieces of evidence for the use of sound technology in ancient civilizations is the presence of various acoustic structures that have been discovered around the world. These structures, which include things like stone circles, megaliths and pyramids, have been found to have remarkable acoustic properties that suggest they may have been designed for a specific purpose. For example, the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt has been found to have a complex series of chambers and shafts that seem to have been designed to amplify sound. Similarly, the megaliths at Stonehenge in England have been found to have a variety of acoustic properties that suggest they may have been used for ritual purposes. In addition to these acoustic structures, there are also various legends and myths from ancient cultures that suggest that sound was used for a variety of purposes. For example, in Hindu mythology, the god Shiva is often depicted as playing a drum that is said to have the power to destroy the universe. Another interesting clue comes from the work of researchers like Dr. Hans Jenny, who discovered that certain sound frequencies can cause matter to vibrate and take on specific geometric shapes. This suggests that ancient people may have had an understanding of sound and vibration that allowed them to create complex geometric patterns in their art and architecture. While there is no definitive evidence to suggest that ancient civilizations used sound technology in the way that we use it today, there is certainly enough evidence to suggest that they had a much greater understanding of sound and vibration than we previously thought. As our understanding of the physics of sound continues to evolve, it is likely that we will discover even more clues about the role that sound played in ancient cultures. The manipulation of sound waves, a concept known as acoustic levitation, has fascinated researchers and scientists for decades. The ability to use sound vibrations to suspend and move objects without physical contact holds promise in various fields. Acoustic levitation relies on sound waves to create standing waves that exert forces on an object, countering the force of gravity. When sound waves intersect and interfere constructively, they produce regions of high pressure, known as antinodes, and regions of low pressure, known as nodes. An object placed at a node remains stable due to the balancing effect of the forces acting on it, effectively defying gravity and appearing suspended in mid-air. The ability to manipulate sound waves and control their interference patterns opens up possibilities for the non-contact handling and manipulation of objects, including potentially lifting heavy stones without the need for physical support or mechanical intervention. Acoustic levitation has been demonstrated with small objects like droplets of liquid, particles, and lightweight materials. However, the application of this principle to lift substantial stones presents significant challenges due to the factors involved. Lifting heavy stones with acoustic levitation would require considerable energy to generate powerful sound waves capable of counteracting the force of gravity. The energy demands might be prohibitively high for practical applications, making it inefficient compared to conventional lifting methods. The density, shape and composition of the stones influence their interaction with sound waves. Large, dense stones may not respond effectively to the vibrations, limiting the practicality of acoustic levitation for lifting heavy materials. The stability of the levitated stones is crucial to prevent them from vibrating excessively or becoming uncontrollable. Ensuring consistent and stable levitation is a challenging engineering problem that requires precision in sound wave generation and control. The use of sound and acoustics played a significant role in ancient cultures, particularly in religious ceremonies, rituals, and architectural design. Archaeological evidence suggests that ancient civilizations, such as the Egyptians, Greeks, Mayans, and others, had a deep understanding of acoustics and its effects on the human psyche. For instance, the use of resonant spaces and amphitheaters in ancient theaters temples and tombs showcased their knowledge of sound amplification and control. It is plausible that these insights into acoustics may have extended to the manipulation of heavy stones during construction. One of the theoretical methods ancient civilizations might have employed to move heavy stones is the concept of resonance, 
and acoustic levitation. Resonance occurs when an object is subjected to a periodic force that matches its natural frequency, leading to amplified vibrations. If an external force could be applied through sound waves at the stone's resonant frequency, it could potentially enhance its movability. If ancient builders understood the principles of acoustic levitation, they might have used it to lift and transport heavy stones with minimal physical effort. Historical accounts and cultural myths of ancient civilizations suggest that they possessed a profound understanding of sound and its effects on matter. Ancient texts describe the use of sound instruments like the Vimana, an ancient flying machine that generated sound waves for various purposes. Moreover, some ancient cultures believed in the power of chanting, mantras and sound vibrations to invoke divine energies and influence physical objects. It is conceivable that such practices might have been applied to move heavy stones through focused sound energy. One of the main challenges in understanding ancient sound technology lies in the scarcity of direct evidence. The passage of time, natural decay and the lack of comprehensive historical records have made it challenging to trace the exact methods and tools used by ancient civilizations. Moreover, ancient knowledge might have been transmitted orally or through symbolic representations, making it challenging to interpret accurately. It is possible that ancient sound technology, if it ever existed, has been lost over the millennia, leaving us with tantalizing clues, but no definitive answers. Whether or not ancient civilizations employed sound technology to move heavy stones, their construction achievements continue to captivate and inspire admiration. The mysteries surrounding these ancient wonders remind us of the boundless potential of human ingenuity and the enduring allure of exploring the secrets of our distant past. Stanley Meyer and his water-powered car Stanley Meyer was an American inventor who claimed to have developed a car that could run entirely on water without the need for any other fuel. His invention, known as the water fuel cell, was said to use a process known as electrolysis to separate water molecules into their constituent parts, hydrogen and oxygen, which would then be used to power the car's engine. Meyer's claims were met with both excitement and skepticism. Stanley Allen Meyer, born on August 24, 1940, resided primarily in East Columbus, Ohio throughout his life. However, he relocated to Grandview Heights, where he completed his high school education. Despite being a religious individual, Meyer possessed a strong passion for innovation. Following his graduation, he pursued a brief military career before briefly considering enrollment at Ohio State University. Stanley Meyer, throughout his life, possessed numerous patents in various domains such as banking, oceanography, cardiac monitoring, and automobiles. Among all of Meyer's patents, the one that garnered the most attention and sparked controversy was the invention of a water-powered car. During the 1960s, Meyer created a patented device that had the capability to produce energy using water, rather than relying on petroleum fuel. Meyer gave this invention the name of fuel cell or water fuel cell. In the 1970s, following a significant increase in global crude oil prices, the cost of oil in the United States experienced a threefold surge. Consequently, the consumption of fuel became much more expensive, resulting in a complete plummeting of car sales. The US government faced immense pressure due to a reduction in oil supply from Saudi Arabia. As a result, numerous companies faced bankruptcy and the American automotive industry suffered a substantial blow. Stanley Meyer embarked on a mission to create a groundbreaking vehicle that would transform the American automotive industry. In his pursuit, he conceptualized a retrofitted automobile known as a fuel cell that had the capability to utilize water as a viable alternative to petroleum-based fuels such as petrol or gasoline. The objective behind this innovation was to reduce dependency on petroleum resources during an era marked by difficulties and challenges. If Stanley Meyer's assertion held true, his innovative invention could potentially spark a paradigm shift in the American automotive sector resulting in significant cost savings for the global economy. Furthermore, it would contribute to mitigating the risk of global warming by minimizing air pollution and introducing oxygen into the atmosphere. Meyer subsequently developed a crimson buggy, which served as the pioneering water-fueled vehicle. 
This groundbreaking hydrogen-powered automobile garnered significant attention as it toured various locations in the United States. The public's fascination with Maya's innovative invention was evident, even earning coverage in a local television news report. During the interview, Maya stated that his hydrogen-powered vehicle would require a mere 22 gallons, or 83 liters of water, to cover the distance between Los Angeles and New York. However, Stanley Meyer passed away on March 20, 1998. While having a meal with two Belgian investors at a restaurant, Meyer abruptly rushed out and uttered the words, They poisoned me, before tragically losing his life. The Grove City Police Force conducted an inquiry in collaboration with the Franklin County Coroner's Office. According to the coroner's report, it was determined that Meyer's passing was a result of a cerebral aneurysm caused by natural factors. It is worth noting that Meyer had a previous medical history of high blood pressure. Meyer's passing may not have seemed extraordinary at first glance, considering he was a 57-year-old businessman with a previous record of high blood pressure. Those interested in this case hold the belief that Meyer had created something powerful enough to challenge the dominance of the oil industry and completely transform the world. Meyer's alleged assassination was purportedly aimed at suppressing his inventions and preventing his fuel cell technology from becoming public knowledge. Consequently, potential suspects include the executive boards of prominent automobile manufacturers, oil companies, and possibly even government entities. There have been speculations that the two Belgian investors themselves may have been responsible for what happened. His supporters still firmly believe that he was taken out due to his technological advancements. However, it is important to note that all of Meyer's patents have now expired and his inventions are freely accessible to the public. Up until now, no engine or vehicle producer has integrated any of Meyer's concepts. The Mystery of the Hole in the Sphinx's Head The Great Sphinx is a large limestone statue located in Giza, Egypt, and is believed to have been constructed during the reign of the Pharaoh Khafre, around 2500 BC. While the Sphinx has been an enduring symbol of ancient Egypt for centuries, it remains shrouded in mystery, with many unanswered questions surrounding its construction and purpose. One of the most intriguing features of the Sphinx is the large hole in its head, which has puzzled researchers and enthusiasts for decades. Some have suggested that the hole was created intentionally as part of the Sphinx's design, while others believe it may have been the result of weathering or erosion over time. One theory suggests that the hole was used as a receptacle for a sacred object or relic, possibly a crystal or gemstone, that was used in ancient rituals or ceremonies. This theory is supported by the fact that similar holes have been found in other ancient Egyptian monuments, such as the Pyramid of Khafre and the Temple of Karnak. Another possibility is that the hole was used for astronomical observations, as it aligns perfectly with the constellation of Leo during the summer solstice. This alignment may have been used by ancient astronomers to mark the beginning of the agricultural season or to track the movements of the stars. However, some researchers believe that the hole is simply the result of weathering and erosion over thousands of years. The Sphinx is located in a desert environment and is constantly exposed to the elements, including sandstorms and strong winds. Over time, these forces may have eroded the limestone and created the hole. Despite the numerous theories and speculations surrounding the hole in the Sphinx's head, no definitive answer has been found. The mystery surrounding this enigmatic statue continues to captivate researchers and enthusiasts and may never be fully solved. As of right now, although various photographs have been presented which shows a hole going directly into the head of the Sphinx, it remains a fascinating and puzzling aspect of this ancient monument. While there are numerous theories and speculations surrounding its purpose, the true answer may never be fully known. The Sphinx continues to stand as a testament to the ingenuity and skill of ancient Egyptian civilization and a reminder of the many mysteries that still remain unsolved. The traditional view is that the Sphinx was built by the Pharaoh Khafre as a symbol of his divine authority and to protect his tomb. However, some scholars argue that the Sphinx may be much older than previously thought, with some even suggesting that it dates back to an earlier period known as the Early Dynastic Period, around 3000 BCE. One of the main arguments used to support this theory is the erosion patterns on the Sphinx's body, 
which many believe are the result of water erosion caused by heavy rainfall. However, the region around the Sphinx is known to be one of the driest in the world, and it is unclear how such heavy rainfall could have occurred. Some have suggested that the Sphinx may have been built during a much wetter period in ancient Egypt's history, which would push its age back by thousands of years. Another theory about the age of the Sphinx comes from the work of geologist Robert Schock, who argued that the erosion patterns on the Sphinx are the result of long-term exposure to groundwater rather than rainfall. According to Schock, the Sphinx may be much older than previously thought, dating back to a time when the region around Giza was covered in water, such as during the last Ice Age. Despite these theories, the traditional view that the Sphinx was built during the reign of Khafre remains the most widely accepted. The pharaoh is known to have commissioned a number of other large-scale building projects during his reign, including the second largest pyramid at Giza, which is located adjacent to the Sphinx. In addition, inscriptions found on the Sphinx's body link it to Khafre's reign. Overall, the age of the Sphinx remains a subject of debate and controversy, with some arguing that it is much older than previously thought, while others maintain that it was built during the reign of Khafre in the Old Kingdom of Ancient Egypt. As further archaeological research and discoveries are made, it is possible that our understanding of the Sphinx's age and significance may continue to evolve. Interestingly, while the origins and purpose of the Sphinx remain a mystery, there has been much speculation about the existence of underground tunnels and chambers beneath the monument. The idea of tunnels or chambers beneath the Sphinx is not new. In fact, it dates back to ancient times, with the Greek historian Herodotus writing about the existence of a secret chamber beneath the Sphinx in the 5th century BCE. In the early 20th century, French archaeologist Émile Barrez conducted extensive excavations around the Sphinx and claimed to have found evidence of a network of tunnels and chambers. In recent years, there have been renewed efforts to investigate the possibility of tunnels beneath the Sphinx. In 1991, American geologist Robert Schoch conducted a seismic survey of the Giza Plateau and claimed to have detected anomalies that could indicate the presence of hollow spaces beneath the Sphinx. In 2008, a team of archaeologists led by Zahi Hawass, former head of the Supreme Council of Antiquities in Egypt, conducted a series of non-invasive surveys of the Sphinx using ground-penetrating radar and other technologies. Their findings revealed a number of anomalies beneath the monument, including a possible cavity or chamber beneath the Sphinx's right paw. Despite these findings, there is still a great deal of debate among archaeologists and Egyptologists about the existence of tunnels beneath the Sphinx. Some argue that the anomalies detected by Schoch and Hawass are simply natural geological features, while others believe that there is still much to be discovered about the monument and its surrounding area. One of the main challenges to the theory of subterranean chambers beneath the Sphinx is the lack of concrete evidence. While there have been numerous surveys and investigations, no one has yet been able to definitively prove the existence of tunnels or chambers beneath the monument. Additionally, the Giza Plateau is known to have a complex system of underground water channels, which can sometimes create false readings on seismic and radar equipment. As of right now, the theory of tunnels and chambers beneath the Great Sphinx is a fascinating topic. While there is some evidence to support the idea, there is also a great deal of skepticism and debate within the archaeological community. Until more concrete evidence is uncovered, the mystery of the Sphinx and its potential subterranean passages will remain unresolved. What happened to the Rapa Nui civilization? The Rapa Nui civilization, also known as the Easter Island civilization, is one of the most fascinating mysteries of human history. The Rapa Nui people were the original inhabitants of Easter Island, a small island located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. This civilization flourished for centuries, leaving behind an incredible legacy of stone statues known as Moai. However, the civilization suddenly collapsed, leaving behind only ruins and unanswered questions. The exact cause of the Rapa Nui collapse is unknown, but many theories have been proposed. One popular theory is that the Rapa Nui people deforested their island, leading to soil erosion and the extinction of many plant and animal species. The lack of resources ultimately led to a collapse of their society. Other theories suggest that the Rapa Nui people may have been victims of overpopulation, disease or conflict with neighboring tribes. Regardless of the cause, 
The legacy of the civilization continues to fascinate people today. The Moai, which are massive stone statues weighing up to 75 tons, continue to attract visitors from all over the world. The Moai are a testament to the incredible skill and artistry of the Rapa Nui people, as well as their determination to leave a lasting legacy. In recent years, efforts have been made to better understand the Rapa Nui civilization and their legacy. Archaeologists and historians have worked to uncover new evidence and shed light on the mysteries of their society. Additionally, efforts have been made to preserve the Moai and other cultural artifacts of the Rapa Nui people. As of right now, this civilization is a fascinating and mysterious part of human history. The collapse of their society remains a mystery, but their legacy lives on through the incredible Moai statues that they left behind. The Mystery of the Aboriginal Fairy Circles Aboriginal fairy circles, also known as grass circles, are circular patterns of bare earth surrounded by rings of grass or vegetation found predominantly in the grasslands of the Western Australian outback. These mysterious patterns have long been a source of fascination for researchers and many theories have been put forward to explain their formation. The fairy circles range in size from a few centimetres to several metres in diameter and they are evenly spaced, forming a pattern across the landscape. The circles are typically surrounded by a ring of tall grass, with the ground inside the circle appearing to be barren and devoid of any vegetation. The circles are often found in areas where the ground is hard and compacted, making it difficult for plants to take root. One of the most popular theories for the formation of fairy circles is that they are the result of termite activity. It is believed that termites create the circles by burrowing underground and feeding on the roots of the grass, causing the grass to die and leaving a circular patch of barren earth. However, this theory has been challenged by researchers who argue that the distribution of the circles is too regular to be the result of random termite activity. Another theory suggests that the circles are created by plants competing for limited resources such as water and nutrients. This theory proposes that the circles are created when plants release chemicals into the soil that inhibit the growth of other plants, creating a ring of barren earth around the plant. A more recent theory proposes that the fairy circles are the result of water movement and redistribution in the soil. According to this theory, water accumulates in the center of the circle, creating a wet zone that is conducive to plant growth. The roots of the plants growing in the wet zone then draw water away from the outer edge of the circle, creating a ring of dry earth. Despite the many theories put forward to explain the fairy circles, their true origin remains a mystery. Some researchers have suggested that the circles may have a cultural significance for Aboriginal communities in the region and that they may have been used for ceremonial or spiritual purposes. As of right now, the Aboriginal fairy circles remain a fascinating and mysterious phenomenon that continues to intrigue researchers and the public alike. While several theories have been proposed to explain their formation, None have been definitively proven, leaving the true origin of these intriguing patterns a mystery. The Mystery of the Pirate Utopia The idea of a pirate utopia, a society where pirates could live freely and equally, has long captured the imagination of people. One such legendary pirate utopia is Libertalia, located on a small island off Madagascar. Though many details of the story are likely embellished or entirely fictional, the legend of Libertalia is still fascinating. According to the legend, Libertalia was founded by a French pirate named Captain Misson, who gathered a group of pirates and sailors who shared his ideals of freedom, democracy, and equality. Misson envisioned a society where everyone had an equal say and an equal share of the wealth. Women were also said to be treated equally in Libertalia, a highly unusual concept for the time. The pirate utopia of Libertalia was said to have been located on the island of Sainte Marie, off the east coast of Madagascar. The island was a popular spot for pirates in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, as it was well positioned for raiding passing ships. The pirates reportedly built a community with well-organized laws and a democratic government, where disputes were settled by a vote of the people. While the story of Libertalia may sound like a romantic pirate fantasy, there is some historical evidence to support its existence. The first known mention of the pirate utopia comes from the book A General History of the Pirates by Captain Charles Johnson, published in 1724. However, many historians believe that the story is a work of fiction 
or at best a highly embellished account of pirate life. Despite the lack of evidence, the story of Libertalia has continued to capture the public imagination. In recent years, there has been renewed interest in the legend, with books, articles, and even a video game exploring the idea of a pirate utopia. Some have even suggested that the story of Libertalia may have inspired real-life attempts at creating utopian societies, such as the 19th-century Oneida community in New York. Supernatural Large Black Cats In recent years, reports of large black cats have begun to surface all across the United Kingdom. Some believe that the cats are supernatural shadowy beasts that can appear and disappear in a moment's notice, whereas others believe that they're an invasive species growing across the United Kingdom that the government is purposefully trying to cover up for reasons not entirely known. Regardless of the cause of these rising witness reports, it appears that the sightings have remained largely consistent and are growing across the entirety of the United Kingdom. Many theories and myths have popped up surrounding the idea that a rich private collector could have been illegally importing the creatures that soon found themselves freed all throughout the region, a theory that would explain quite reasonably how the beast came to be and why it would be in the open rural areas where the creatures are commonly reported. Others believe that the large black cats sighted are direct descendants of the native wildcat species that was believed to have gone completely extinct in Britain more than a hundred years ago, but is now making a comeback with rising populations. Hikers continue to report strange deer carcasses left inside trees that show evidence of a large predator across the region, with some hikers claiming to have encountered the panther-like species altogether, only to slowly back away and get to safety before it disappears once again, with no evidence of their encounters ever having taken place to begin with. The Nucker Dragon The Nucker Dragon is a legendary creature said to have lived in Sussex, England. According to the legend, the dragon lived in a cave near a pond known as Nucker Hole, located in the village of Liminster. The dragon would emerge from the cave and terrorise the surrounding area, attacking livestock and people. The story of the Nucker Dragon dates back to medieval times and has been passed down through generations by word of mouth. The earliest written record of the dragon comes from a poem by Richard Holland, written in the early 15th century. According to legend, the villagers were eventually able to slay the dragon by luring it out of its cave with a pig. They then attacked it with swords and spears, finally taking it out. The dragon's body was said to have been buried beneath a nearby mound, which came to be known as the Nucker's Grave. The Nucker Dragon is thought to have been a symbol of the struggle between Christianity and paganism, as well as the conflict between the Saxons and the invading Normans. Some historians believe that the story of the dragon was used by the Normans to demonize the Saxons and portray them as primitive and superstitious. Despite the passage of time, the legend of the Nucker Dragon continues to be told in Sussex, and the dragon remains an important part of the area's folklore. In the town of Lansing, there is a pub called the Nucker Hole, which pays homage to the legendary creature. The area around Nucker Hole is also a popular destination for hikers and tourists interested in the story of the dragon. Overall, the story of the Nucker Dragon is an example of how folklore can endure over centuries and become an important part of a region's cultural heritage. Nestled in the desolate landscape of Jordan and Syria, the Big Circles are a collection of 12 giant circular stone structures, leaving archaeologists and researchers baffled by their purpose and origin. These enigmatic archaeological wonders span across ancient civilizations and are believed to date back as far as 2500 BCE. The Big Circles, also known as the Big Circles of Jordan, were first discovered from the air in the 1920s during aerial surveys of the region. Their impressive size and distinctive circular shapes immediately captured the attention of researchers and sparked fascination about their origin and function. These mysterious structures are spread across parts of Jordan and Syria, with the majority located in Jordan's arid and sparsely inhabited desert regions. The big circles vary in size, with diameters ranging from approximately 200 to 400 meters. Constructed using large stones placed in circular formations, these monuments are characterized by their scale and precision, attesting to the remarkable engineering and architectural abilities of the ancient civilizations that built them. The origins of the big circles have been linked to prehistoric times, possibly dating as far back as the Bronze Age, around 2500 BCE. 
Theories suggest that they were built by various ancient cultures, including the early Bronze Age civilizations of the Levant, who inhabited the region during that time. The purpose of these structures remains a subject of speculation. Some researchers propose that they were used for astronomical observations or as calendrical markers given their alignment with celestial events and solstices. Others suggest that they served as ritual sites, possibly linked to burial practices or religious ceremonies. The big circles are not isolated monuments, but rather part of a larger network of ancient cultural and architectural achievements in the region. The landscape is dotted with other intriguing structures, such as dolmens, cairns, and standing stones, further adding to the mysterious allure of the area. These ancient constructions reflect the cultural sophistication and spiritual beliefs of the early civilizations inhabiting the region. Their massive scale and precise alignments speak to the reverence these ancient cultures had for celestial events and their relationship with the cosmos. Deciphering the purpose and function of the big circles poses significant challenges for researchers. The lack of written records or inscriptions associated with these monuments makes it difficult to determine their exact significance to the ancient cultures that built them. Furthermore, the ancient civilizations that created the big circles have left little other evidence of their existence, making it challenging to place the monuments within a broader cultural context. Theories about their purpose remain speculative, and researchers continue to grapple with questions about the motivations behind their construction. The preservation of the big circles and their cultural heritage is of paramount importance. These ancient structures are vulnerable to erosion, vandalism, and encroaching development. The Jordanian government and archaeological institutions have taken steps to protect and conserve these archaeological wonders, recognizing their significance to the country's heritage. Educational initiatives and sustainable tourism practices have also been implemented to raise awareness about the cultural importance of the big circles and promote responsible visitation to these ancient sites. The enigmatic big circles of Jordan offer a captivating glimpse into the ancient past and the cultural legacy of the civilizations that once thrived in the region. These magnificent structures are a testament to the ingenuity and creativity of the ancient architects who designed and constructed them. As our understanding of the ancient civilizations of the Levant deepens, the big circles stand as enigmatic reminders of a time long past, evoking curiosity and wonder about the cultural and historical mysteries that remain buried beneath the desert sands. Archaeologists and researchers continue to investigate these intriguing structures, seeking to unlock their secrets and gain insight into the ancient societies that created them. The Stone Spheres of Costa Rica Nestled amidst the lush rainforests and pristine beaches of Costa Rica lie one of the world's most intriguing archaeological enigmas, the Stone Spheres. These perfectly carved, massive stone spheres, scattered across the country's southern region, have captivated archaeologists, researchers, and travelers alike. The stone spheres of Costa Rica first came to the attention of archaeologists in the 1930s, when the United Fruit Company cleared vast tracts of land for banana plantations. Workers stumbled upon these large, perfectly shaped stones hidden beneath the dense forest canopy. Initial excavation efforts revealed the impressive craftsmanship of these spheres, sparking interest in their origin and purpose. The stone spheres are concentrated in the Diquis Delta, located in Costa Rica's southern Pacific region, specifically in areas around Palmasur and Sierpe. They vary in size, ranging from a few centimeters to over two meters in diameter, and are made from a variety of rocks, including granodiorite and volcanic rock. The origins of the stone spheres have been linked to the pre-Columbian period, with most evidence pointing to their creation between 600 CE and 1600 CE by indigenous cultures. The exact purpose of these spheres remains a subject of speculation, as no written records or inscriptions have been found to provide definitive answers. Numerous theories have emerged over the years, suggesting that the stone spheres may have served as symbolic representations of celestial bodies, navigational aids, or markers for ceremonial sites. Their perfect spherical shapes and alignment with celestial events have led some to propose that they had astronomical and calendrical significance in ancient cultures. The stone spheres of Costa Rica 
exhibit remarkable engineering and artistic skill, especially considering the tools available to ancient artisans. The precision of their shape and alignment with celestial events suggest a sophisticated understanding of geometry and astronomy. To create these stone spheres, ancient craftsmen likely used stone tools, sand and water to grind and shape the rocks into their desired forms. The sheer scale and precision of these spheres showcase the high level of craftsmanship and dedication invested in their creation. In recognition of their cultural significance and the need for preservation, the stone spheres of Costa Rica were designated as a United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization World Heritage Site in 2014. This recognition highlights their importance not only to Costa Rica's heritage, but also to humanity's understanding of ancient civilizations and their cultural achievements. Despite their status, the stone spheres face conservation challenges due to factors like urban development and vandalism. Rising sea levels and increasing rainfall can accelerate erosion and threaten the integrity of these ancient artifacts. Additionally, encroaching development poses a risk to the sphere's preservation as some of these sites are near urban centers and tourist attractions. Efforts by the Costa Rican government and local communities are underway to protect and preserve these cultural treasures. Educational initiatives and sustainable tourism practices aim to raise awareness about the significance of the stone spheres and promote responsible visitation to these archaeological sites. Despite significant research and archaeological investigations, many questions about the stone spheres of Costa Rica remain unanswered. The lack of inscriptions or written records from the time of their creation poses challenges in deciphering their exact purpose and significance. Researchers continue to study the stone spheres using advanced scientific techniques including 3D scanning and geochemical analysis to gain further insights into their composition and origins. Interdisciplinary research and collaborations between archaeologists, astronomers and indigenous communities offer hope for unraveling more of the mysteries surrounding these enigmatic artifacts. As of right now, the stone spheres of Costa Rica stand as silent witnesses to an ancient past, shrouded in mystery and imbued with cultural significance. Their presence in the lush rainforests of Costa Rica sparks curiosity and wonder, drawing visitors from around the world to witness their exquisite craftsmanship and enigmatic allure. As research and conservation efforts continue, these stone spheres offer a glimpse into the sophisticated knowledge and creativity of pre-Columbian cultures. While many questions about their purpose and significance remain unanswered, their designation as a World Heritage Site ensures that they will continue to be preserved and revered as a valuable part of Costa Rica's cultural heritage and a lasting symbol of our shared human history. Something interesting has just been captured by a local resident in Oregon. The individual who captured the object called 911 and said that they could see a large fireball in the sky, noting that they were worried that it might have been a plane that was having some difficulty. The images were then posted to social media, with various people putting forward their own theories for what it could have been. The 911 call revealed that the individual had taken pictures of the event, with Polk County Sheriff's Office soon arriving on the scene and taking their own photographs. Once officials in Oregon arrived on the scene, they reported that they started looking for a crash site. However, as the investigation continued, it's reported that the Sheriff's Office along with locals in the area who turned up to help, couldn't find any evidence that something had crashed. Oddly enough, when investigators started to conduct further research, they reported that no plane was reported missing, but did note that there was a recent meteor shower in the area. The Polk County Sheriff's Office said the following, That's what it was more likely attributed to, or what was seen. Although we're not 100% sure. End quote. The mysterious object was first seen at around 4.50 in the afternoon, but the sheriff's office said that their helicopter searches turned up nothing. The size of a meteor that NASA or any other space agency can detect depends on a variety of factors, such as the sensitivity of their detection instruments, the distance between the meteor and the Earth, and the speed and trajectory of the meteor. NASA has a program called the Near Earth Object Observations Program, which is designed to detect, track, and characterize asteroids and comets that could potentially pose a threat to Earth. 
The program uses a combination of ground-based telescopes and space-based instruments to search for these objects. Generally, NASA and other space agencies can detect meteoroids as small as a few millimeters in size using ground-based telescopes, but they typically focus on detecting larger objects that could potentially pose a threat to Earth, such as those larger than 140 meters or 459 feet in diameter. However, it's worth noting that not all meteors are detected before they enter Earth's atmosphere. Small meteoroids can enter the atmosphere undetected and produce visible meteor trails also known as shooting stars. These are usually harmless and pose no threat to Earth. Authorities further reported that after several investigations had taken place throughout the area, utilizing helicopters and people on the ground, there was no sign of the fireball and also no impact site that would help them positively identify what the object was. The Sheriff's Office posted on its Facebook page and reached out to the public, saying that they did not know the exact location of where this happened. What's strange is that this isn't the first time that one of these strange fireballs has been witnessed in the sky. Oddly enough, other residents have said that while seeing these strange objects, they've also heard mysterious booms and questioned whether jets had been scrambled to investigate whatever these objects are. As many have reported, these strange fireballs have been seen above various countries, and in most of these cases, the strange objects have prompted police to investigate the sighting further. Many have said the same thing, suggesting that the fireball is an aeroplane that was in trouble, but some have disputed this, saying that although planes do fly over most of these regions, a lot of the time one didn't fly over at the specific time that the object was seen. As of right now, people are still speculating as to what these objects are and where they're coming from. The Central Intelligence Agency has recently declassified decades worth of documents that looked into mysterious aircrafts. This caused excitement among amateur researchers, with them saying that those who've looked into these sightings have known about them for years. There's been approximately 2,700 documents that have been uploaded online, most of which detail the government's involvement with strange aircrafts. Those who've spent years researching this topic have said this is direct proof that the government is interested in this topic, and that it shows they've set aside large budgets to investigate what they are and how they're able to achieve what they do. However, although it seemed as though the Central Intelligence Agency was giving the general public an insight into some of their documents, those who looked into the files were not impressed. Basically, people couldn't read these documents, and in some cases, all of the information had been blacked out. Many comments followed a similar theme, with online users saying what was the point in releasing these documents if you're going to cross out all of the information. The Sheffield Incident Yorkshire in England isn't known for its abundance of mysterious aircrafts, but in 1997 on the 24th of March, local police received dozens of calls saying that some sort of aircraft had crashed in the region's lonely moors. The calls mentioned a low-flying plane or aircraft that had passed overhead towards the hills and mountains before disappearing. This was then followed by a bright flash and an explosion that could be heard for miles around. With reports of a crashed air vehicle, the police immediately began a search and rescue mission. A police helicopter, along with the fire service and mountain rescue, searched the area far and wide for any sign of the downed aircraft. Similarly, a local hospital was given notice of potential casualties. Soon after, air traffic control and the Royal Air Force were sent news of the crash by police. Strangely, each of the organizations reported back that they had no missing aircrafts and that no military vehicles were currently flying in the area. This then led to the use of a Royal Air Force Sea King helicopter to assist the police in their search, and yet, after covering 40 square miles with dozens of professionals and high-grade equipment, nothing was found. In response to the lack of any kind of physical debris, the police launched a phone line for reports of a crash site. Almost immediately, the phone line was inundated with callers claiming to have seen military jets, as well as some kind of mysterious aircraft. With so many people reporting similar sightings, the police were forced to increase the scope of their previous search and enlisted even more members of Mountain Rescue. Similarly, the Royal Air Force cordoned a 10-mile air exclusion zone around Howden Reservoir. Despite these efforts, nothing was recovered and the search was called off. Yorkshire police were left confused by the lack of evidence and were unsure of how to proceed. Some members of the public claimed the sighting was the cause of a phantom ghost plane. 
Later in 1997, a police representative said the following, No explanation was ever found, and we remain open-minded about what was behind the sightings. End quote. In the years following, many theories have been posited in order to uncover what really happened over Sheffield that day. Some claim a cover-up had taken place by the military who were in pursuit of a mysterious aircraft. The crash, as the theory goes, was caused by a military jet. Since the Royal Air Force exclusion zone was put around the Howden Reservoir, this has led some to believe that the plane crashed into the water and bodies may have been retrieved during the search. Interestingly, the event was mentioned in the House of Commons on the 23rd of March in 1998. The then Ministry of Defence stated that there had been a low-flying military exercise taking place in that area on the 24th of March of the previous year. Scientists also support this, as the Seismology Department in Edinburgh confirmed that on the 24th of March, two sonic booms took place at 9.52 and 6 minutes past 10 in the evening. According to the department, these booms were likely to have been caused by an aircraft travelling at supersonic speeds or space debris burning up in the atmosphere. Still, the Royal Air Force refutes any involvement in the events described by onlookers, specifically because it was illegal to break the sound barrier over the United Kingdom. Likewise, they state that their exclusion zone was not out of the ordinary for routine search and rescue operations and that they had no record of sonic booms by the Royal Air Force. The facts don't all seem to add up in this case, and the peculiar event that took place over the Yorkshire Moors still perplexes many enthusiasts to this day. What exactly did crash near Sheffield in 1997? Many amateur researchers who've looked into this case have said that the Royal Air Force are unlikely to admit that they were involved in this strange event and suggested that it was likely covered up by officials in the region. One user suggested that a mysterious aircraft was seen above the area and so the Royal Air Force scrambled a couple of jets to investigate what the object was. This would explain the sonic booms that were heard in the evening. Investigations carried on and said that what most likely happened was a chase between the strange aircraft and the jets, but suggested that perhaps one of the jets malfunctioned and then crashed into the ground. Oddly enough, others who've looked into this case have said that pilots from across the world have reported the same thing, saying that when their jets get close to these objects, they start acting strange, noting that these aircrafts seem to have the ability to turn off the jets' electrics. This has caused some confusion in recent years, as the jets aren't being directly attacked, but are having some of their major functions shut down. As of right now, there's several of these documents that go into detail about mysterious aircrafts. One question that people have when it comes to these events is why don't governments just be open and honest with the general public? The answer to that question comes down to national security. They've openly admitted that these aircrafts are a national security threat, as they've been observed outmaneuvering their jets and also making their way into restricted airspace. This brings up a variety of different questions. How are they able to do this? How can they outmaneuver our most advanced jets? How do they achieve the speeds they've been observed doing? And ultimately, who do they belong to? As of right now, we can only speculate as to what these objects are and hope that within the near future, the public will be told more about these mysterious aircrafts. So, what do you make of this strange object? Do you think it's a meteor, or is it something more mysterious? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comment section below and help us to grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.